Okay, we're heading down the home stretch now, and the last uh, thing we need to talk about in this section is the urinary system. Um, the urinary system works well with the gastrointestinal system as a combination, simply because with the gastrointestinal system, we realized that what we did was we took nutrients and, con and transformed these nutrients into molecular size bites so they could be absorbed into the bloodstream or in the lymphatic system, like we talked about before, uh, so they could be used for nutrients in other places. However, every time we use these nutrients and things like that, they're going to be waste products that are performed, that are produced. Okay, it's sort of like when you make dinner. There's always something that ends up in the garbage. So even with all these nutrients being used, there's still going to be some waste. The problem is, is if you let all that waste build up and build up and build up, and we have collection, garbage collection. Next thing you know, the whole house will be filled with garbage. Okay, you don't want to be a hoarder. I'm seeing on on hoarders or anything like that. But what happens is we have to get rid of it. How do we get rid of most of this waste? We get most of this rid of this waste, most of this waste by not dumping it back into the gastrointestinal system and eliminating it in fecal material. Very rarely does that happen. There are a couple of medications where that may happen, but in most cases, in most of the things, it doesn't. But we actually put it in through the through the circulatory system, put it through the kidneys. It gets filtered and, and eliminated through the kidneys. So the kidneys are going to be really important in getting rid of all these wastes because if those wastes build up, those wastes over a period of time will become toxic and we get load with waste. So that's what the urinary system really basically does. Okay. So we know that it does a couple things. When we look at the overall function of the urinary, urinary system, it regulates volume. Okay. Uh, if you drink more fluid, what do you do? You urinate more. Okay. If you drink less fluid, and you're dehydrated. What do you do? You drink more. And so therefore what happens is the urine will be conserved if, if I'm dehydrated and will be eliminated more if I become over 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 and over hydrated okay it also changes the composition of the urine in other words if you look at your urine I don't know maybe you are maybe you aren't but if you look at your urine sometimes it's darker sometimes it's lighter sometimes it's more clear sometimes it's more yellow and and darker and and that's because there are either there's more or less material in there depending upon what I need to get rid of okay it creates a balance of substances in the blood or the homeostasis now again the the the, the chemicals in my blood all the materials in my blood everything that circula circulates around for me to live is regulated by the hypothalamus but then what happens is it's eventually filtered to keep into a fine level or a fine narrow range of what's normal by the kidneys okay we also find that the kidneys get rid of what are called nitrogenous waste. Uh, proteins are largely nitrogenous materials. So when we break down proteins, one of the big byproducts of that is nitrogen, okay? And and the only place I could actually get rid of this nitrogen is through the urine, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We also know that the urine gets is sort of in, is, is also involved in, in pH balance. Now, what do I mean about pH balance? Again, we talked in multiple videos before about how the body likes a pH between about 7.35 to about 7.45, give or take a little bit on both sides, okay? We might go up to 7.48, something like that, 7.5. Once you get above that, we get into some problems. What happens is uh, when we talked in the, in the respiratory um, uh, video PowerPoint, we talked about how carbon dioxide can be helping as a buffer because the carbon dioxide combines with water becomes H2CO3, and H2CO3 dissociates into H plus HCO3 negative, okay? Well, I could use that HCO3 negative, which is a base, to buffer an acid. I could use the H positive to buffer a base, okay? However, I don't want to have too much of that H positive ion, the, you know, the uh, positive ion that, that, uh, to build up, as well as the HCO3 negative. I don't need that. So what happens? Hmm, too much? you get rid of it through the kidneys. So the kidneys help to do that as well. So in other words, if somebody's um, acidotic or if their pH is low, it usually means there's a high level of all this hydrogen ion in their blood. So what do they do? Filter it out, get rid of it through the kidney. So as we have a pH abnormality, we could buffer it two ways. Number one, through the respiratory system by that, that breaking or that, that dissociation of, of bicarbonate, H2CO3, or we could do it by eliminating it either through too much of the bicarbonate in the urine if I'm too uh, basic, or too alkalotic, or the hydrogen in my urine if I'm too acidotic. So the kidneys are also very important in regards to the uh, pH balance. Mineral balance. Mineral balance is also very important. Okay. A typical example, mineral, I'm talking about things like calcium, magnesium, and stuff. We, earlier in the year, we talked about the importance of calcium, and everybody initially said, oh, it's for good, strong bones. But we hopefully now I've proven to you that, that we need calcium a lot more for muscle contraction, nerve conduction, uh, uh, cardiac muscle contraction, and things like that. So if my level of calcium goes down, 
Okay, if my level of calcium for one reason goes down, either my dietary intake's not enough or whatever the case may be, the, um, the uh, uh, hypothalamus senses this, sends a signal to my parathyroid glands. And behind the parathyroid, or behind the thyroid, I have these four to eight little small little nodules, and they're called the parathyroids. The parathyroids make, and at that point, if the calcium levels are low, the parathyroids secrete a hormone called parathyroid hormone, PTH, parathyroid hormone or parathormone. And what the parathyroid hormone, it does, it does three things. Number one, it goes to the bone and takes the calcium out of the bone because they need it more in the blood to be able to serve nerve conduction, muscle contraction, cardiac muscle contraction, and stuff like that. Second thing it does, it goes to the GI system and says, hey, we need you to save more of that calcium in your diet. So it actually increases the absorption of calcium in the gut. Perfect. What's the third thing? It says, okay, here's your job. What you need to do, kidneys, is when you get calcium, don't get rid of it, save it. So it starts to save the calcium. So we're able to have mineral uh, balance by using the urinary system as well as other systems to try to keep this balance straight. So that's just one example of that mineral balance. Elimination of excess ions or electrolytes. If I have too much sodium, you get rid of my sodium. If you get rid of, you have too much potassium, you get to eliminate too much more potassium. And again, those have to be balanced because we know about the sodium on the outside of a cell, potassium on the inside, plus other things that we have in the blood. Elimination of drugs and toxic substances. Okay. Uh, one of the problems that we get is when we take a certain medication, um, the medication is frequently activated as it gets through the GI system and it gets through the liver and the liver activates it and puts it back out in the blood so it could do its job wherever it needs to go. But what happens is drugs have what are called a half-life. And a half-life means that after a certain amount of time, this material will start to degenerate or deteriorate. So as a result, as it deteriorates, I get this stuff that's basically becoming worthless, but if it builds up, becomes toxic. How do I get rid of those toxins, those extra medications? You eliminate it through the urine. That's why they do urinary drug testing. What they're doing is they know that when people take certain drugs, so what happens is they'll break it down to metabolites or things that the, that the, that the drug is broken down to, and those metabolites show up in the urine. Okay. We also know that the, that the urinary system participates in other things that we'd never even think about. Vitamin D synthesis. Vitamin D is important uh, for, for strong bones and things like that. Well, vitamin D is basically um, the, the sunlight converts uh, uh, the, the inactive vitamin D in the area of the of the of the um a skin, okay? That's why skin and sunlight is really important for vitamin D. What happens is vitamin D also, what it does is try to help make strong bones. It actually is what actually helps to put the calcium into the bone. So at this point, I'm going to have that, the, as the vitamin D is being produced and synthesized, I'm going to have the, 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 the kidneys say, hey, we're not going to get rid of the calcium. We're going to keep the calcium. So that helps in that because the calcium is really important in that conversion as well. We also have the stimulation of red blood cell production, okay? Um, people who are anemic, Okay, the kidneys know this. For some reason, they have a little <clears throat> spy there that says, hey, aren't you a little anemic? And they find that the body's a little anemic, which means they have a low red blood cell count. So what they do, the kidneys create a, uh, or secrete a hormone called EPO. EPO stands for erythropoietin. And erythropoietin then circulates, because it is a hormone, hormones go out in the blood, they circulate, and it goes to the bone marrow. When it goes to the bone marrow, there are certain cells in the bone marrow called stem cells. About 1 to 2% of the cells in the bone marrow are stem cells. It goes to the stem cells and says, hey, you know what? We're short on red blood cells. Well, what does the stem cell do? The stem cell could be whatever blood cell it wants to be. However, under the influence of erythropoietin, it tells that stem cell, you will be a red cell. No, no questions about it. You will be a red cell. So all of a sudden we make more red blood cells if we're down because the kidney secretes this hormone called erythropoietin. Also, the kidneys are essential and exceptionally important in the regulation of blood pressure. Okay, we'll talk about this a little bit later in, uh, in, in, in uh, one of our upcoming video um, uh, PowerPoints. Okay, and what happens is there's a little area right by where the, where the blood is filtered in the kidney. Okay, and these multiple little units called nephrons, which we'll talk about in our second video. And what happens is there's a little area right there that detects the amount of sodium and water, sodium and fluid in the blood. If that's low, it means that there's low pressure that the blood pressure is low. So what happens is when this little area, this macula densa, de detects that the blood pressure is low by a low, low, low amount of sodium and water in the blood as it goes past it, the little sensors there, what it does is the kidneys are then forced to release another hormone called renin. Renin then converts something called angiotensinogen into what's called angiotensin 1. 
okay and then angiotensin 1 gets in the circulation goes to the lungs and in the lungs there's another enzyme and it's called angiotensin converting enzyme a C E angiotensin converting enzyme. And what the angiotensin converting enzyme does, it takes the angiotensin one and converts it to angiotensin two. Angiotensin two is causes vasoconstriction. When vasoconstriction occurs, what happens? The vessel size decreases. As a result, the pressure of the of the fluid inside there goes up. So I elevate my blood pressure. That's what happens. So we have this this renin angiotensin uh, angiotensinogen to angiotensin one to angiotensin two uh, thing that happens because the blood pressure is low. Another interesting thing that happens after the angiotensin two is formed. Okay, uh, what happens is also the angiotensin two goes to what's called the adrenal gland, which sits on top or the called the adrenal or suprarenal because they sit right on top of the adrenal glands. They go to the adrenal glands and, the, and they force the adrenal glands to secrete another hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone. And what aldosterone does, it goes to the kidneys and says, hey, save the sodium. Don't get rid of the sodium. Keep it. Why? Because where sodium goes in the body, water goes. If the kidneys save sodium, what else are they going to save? They're also going to save water. If they save water, what does it do? It increases the volume, increases the volume in the vessels. Vessels then, even if they aren't as constricted as possible, they're fuller than they were before, so the pressure goes up. So all these systems are involved with the kidney and the and urinary system, much more than you thought, other than just producing urine, which is a pain in the neck. Okay, so basically that's what we have. So where do we go from there? Okay, basically the urinary system is much easier than the gastrointestinal system in regards to organs. If I look here, I have a very limited number of organs that I have to actually worry about. Okay, if I look at that, let me get this here. Oops. I have a very limited number of organs that I have. Okay, if I look here, here's a kidney. Here's a kidney right there. So I have two kidneys. Okay, I have two ureters, and that's the tube that takes the urine that's formed in the kidney. The, the kidney, the, the, the urine's already formed. I have two ureters. I have one urinary bladder which sits down in here. And then I have one tube to the outside, which is called the urethra, and that's it. Two kidneys, two ureters, a urinary bladder, and urethra. What happens in those are magic, though. There's lots of stuff that happens in these small organs. Let's talk about each of those individually for the rest of this PowerPoint. Okay. First of all, the kidneys. The kidneys, like I mentioned in the in the GI section, don't float up and down. Okay, they're not sitting there bobbing up and down, but they're stuck to the backside of the abdominal wall. They don't move a whole lot. There's a little bit of movement because the liver moves up and down a little bit with the with the diaphragm as the diaphragm moves. Remember how we talked about that falciform ligament that suspends the liver from the diaphragm? See, I love it when it all comes together. Everything is meshing. It's beautiful. What happens as the diaphragm goes up and down, the liver goes up and down, and the, and the kidneys have to buffer that because they're sitting on the backside of the abdominal wall. Okay, and in sort of the flanks. If you actually put your hand, you could feel the lower ribs. So those floating ribs down there. The top half of the kidney is a little bit above that floating rib. The bottom half of the kidney is a little bit below. Okay, They're retroperitoneal. Everybody should know what retroperitoneal is. We know that peritoneum, I mentioned it 50 times in the last couple, last five lectures or last five videos. And basically that's that membrane inside that covers the abdomen inside all the inside walls as well as all the uh, all the viscera in the abdomen. The peritoneum sticks the kidneys to the back side of the wall, back, back, back wall of the abdomen. Okay, So that's it. They're at the level of L12 to T3, or to, excuse me, level of t12 to about l3 okay so they sit there right below those lower ribs in there they're right about that they're about the size of your fist okay so they're not monster size they're about the size of the fist kidney here kidney here about two sides of the fist they're posterior in my abdomen like we talked about they're against the back side of the abdominal wall and they're subcostal they're right where the ribs meet the abdomen in the lower portion of the back okay um, they're surrounded by a renal capsule okay what happens is besides the peritoneum holding the kidney to the back side of the wall they're actually protect, protected a little bit. They're covered with fat, okay? They have a lot of fat around the kidneys. And then there's also a um, sheet of fascia, like we've talked about before. Fascia is that dense connective tissue that holds it in place. It's called the renal fascia. It sort of helps to protect the kidney, okay? So against trauma and stuff like that, okay? When we look at the kidney, the kidney has a couple spots, a couple things I think you know, you should, you should know about. First of all, if I look at the outside here, this outside rim on the outside, it's not showing up very well, but the outside rim, that brownish area is called the cortex. The, the functional unit of the kidney, which is called the nephron, actually starts there, but ends up deeper inside the kidney. The yellow area that's inside here is called the renal medulla, the renal medulla, okay? 
So we have the cortex on the outside, which, and, and if any time you see cortex is on the outside, you know, cerebral cortex is on the outside, okay? But the medulla is on the inside, cortex is on the outside. Um, what happens is eventually inside the kidneys are these open spots, okay? If you look here, let me see if I could draw that little, um, outline a little better. There's little open spots here, okay? You can hard to see the, the line here. Let me see if I can do a different color in here. That's still not doing very good. Inside there. They're called calyces, okay? And these calyces, there's a bunch of them. Some of them are smaller, they're called minor calyces. Some are bigger, they're called major calyces. And these calyces are where the finished urine collects inside the kidney itself. Eventually what happens is the kidneys, all these calyces, okay, all the calyces come together. When they come together, they end up with an area right here, which is called the renal pelvis renal pelvis and that renal pelvis then leads down to the outside to the tube that goes to the outside which is called the ureter okay so that renal pelvis is that where all these calyces drain into before the urine leaves the leaves the kidney and it leads out to the ureter okay one other thing I want to show on this image right here is this area right and let me erase everything else and see if I could if, if it will show up a little bit better I'm not nothing much is going on here okay if I look at this area right here, okay, that area, just like in the lung, was called the hilum. Guess what they call that? That's also called the hilum. So that's called the hilum of the kidney. Everything enters or leaves the kidney through that area. You see the renal artery there, you see the renal vein, and you see the ureter leaving the kidney um, uh, at that area of the hilum. Also, any kind of nerve supply or anything like that will also go in or out there. There's nothing that goes in or out around the outside. Nothing around the outside. It's all right in the area of the hilum right in here. Okay, so that's all. Blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves, the ureter starts there, and so forth. Okay, so the kidney has the outer cortex, has the medulla that's on the inside of that. Uh, we have the calyces, which are open vats inside the kidneys, which actually collect the urine. And then what happens is all those calyces come together they actually form what's called the, 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 the renal pelvis, okay? And uh, from the renal pelvis, the renal pelvis then continues to the outside as a long tube that goes down the backside of the abdominal wall, which is called the ureter, okay? So that's what we see there. And, you know, then we get to the ureters, okay? Now, the ureters are, are also retroperitoneal, behind the peritoneum, okay? They're stuck to the backside of the abdominal wall. And they're basically smooth muscle. They're smooth muscle tubes. And what happens is the urine's going to have to come from the kidneys down all the way to the bladder. Now, the bladder is actually sitting right behind the pubis. Everybody should know where the pubis is. It sits right in that little hollowed out area of the pelvis, okay, right behind the pubis. So the ureters are smooth muscles that will come down the posterior abdominal wall, stuck to the backside of the, of the abdominal wall. And what happens is they're smooth muscle. Now, a couple things happen to make the urine go down. First of all, a gravity. You know, uh, it's easy, you know when when you're upright, the urine, the fluid is going to fall. So urine is going to fall down these tubes, and it's, it's final urine falls down those tubes. Also, uh, hydrostatic pressure. What do I mean by hydrostatic pressure? As the calyces are making, are, are collecting with more urine, and they get to that renal pelvis, and they're pushed out of the renal pelvis in the ureter, that's pushing more fluid down the tube. Okay, so it's pushing more fluid down the tube. The third thing that actually makes urine move down is peristalsis. Remember we talked about the peristalsis in the GI tract, where it's the sequential squeezing of the of the of the of the intestines to move things along. The same thing happens in the ureter. It starts squeezing at the top, squeeze, 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 and pushes it down. If any if you've known anybody that's had a kidney stone, they get this what's called colicky pain. And what happens is stone is made in the ureter, is made in the in the in the kidney, falls into the ureter and gets stuck. If it's over about five millimeters, it's going to get stuck. It gets stuck in the in the in the ureter. Then the ureter says, "Hmm, something's blocking me. What's going on down there? I don't know. Let's just push it out." They part, start to push by squeeze, and the squeezing of this peristalsis is what causes this this cramping pain that people get. And then it gets it sort of says, "I can't do this anymore," and it backs off. And it relaxes for a minute. It says, "You know what? I got to give it another try." Ooh, it squeezes again, and then backs off. And it does this over and over and over again until it either moves the stone or it can't do it anymore, and it's finally says I'm done I just can't do this anymore okay uh, another interesting thing about the ureter now if you look at the bottom picture down there on the right hand side the the, the, the open area is called the bladder the urinary bladder and again that's sitting behind the, the pubis interestingly enough it, the the ureters don't empty into the top of the bladder mm -hmm, they don't do that they actually go to the back side of the bladder and when they get about halfway down a little bit a little bit less than halfway down they actually burrow through the wall of the bladder and they're going to actually enter exit 
right where you see it says ureteral openings right there, they exit down here. So they actually burrow through the wall right here and right here to get down there. Now that's important because it creates a valve-like mechanism, okay? When the, when the bladder is filling up, I don't want the urine to go back up the ureters. Do I? No, I don't want to go. It's, it's left the kidney. It's left it. Elvis is gone. He's out of the building. Get him out. We want that urine to be out and not go back to the kidneys. So what happens is the kidney, as the bladder starts to expand, it actually closes off that ureter to prevent the urine from going up. Okay. I could still, by hydrostatic pressure, get urine into the bladder, but I can't go upwards. Okay. So it creates almost like a like a like a, a valve-like um, compression when the bladder starts to fill. Because what the, the bladder actually is interesting. We'll talk about that in a minute. The bladder has um, what's called a detrusor muscle, and the detrusor muscle and 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 are special. They're called transitional cells, and these transitional cells are able to stretch a lot. These are cells that really are very stretch stretchable. Okay. And so as a result, that the bladder, even though an Initially, when it's not fully urine, as it barely peaks up above the top of the pubis, it could actually get quite high if that bladder continues to fill. Okay, as the bladder fills, the it closes the ureters, like I talked, which is that valve-like function. Okay, the problem that we sometimes get, especially in kids, gotta, gotta remember one thing about kids. What's the most thing about kids that you have to remember? They are small. Their anatomical structures are smaller. So that valve-like function is smaller and less, which means that urine has a greater chance of going up. And sometimes it's called reflux. And when the reflux, the, the, the bladder is really much more open to bacteria. And I'll explain that in a second, uh, in, a, in a couple seconds. But let's say, let's take for, uh, let's just take for granted here that there's a greater chance of having bacteria in the bladder. Well, how's the bladder going? How's the bacteria going to get to the kidneys? Well, it may go up the ureter if I have that reflux of the urine allowing the, the, the bacteria to float with the urine up towards the kidneys, which is not a good thing, okay? And that would be called pyelonephritis. Actually, most of the pyelonephritis is, is what's called hematogenous, the bacteria in the blood, and it sort of settles in the kidney, okay? We, and then the, then the, the, the ureter, ureter linings are basically a lot of muscle, this muscularis, okay, which provides that, that, that squeezing. The inside of anything is called the mucosa, Okay. Then you have a muscularis layer, and then around the outside you have the serosa, which is basically for the, which is basically the peritoneum. Okay. So that's what we see with the ureters. Finally, we get down to the bladder, and the, again, that bladder is posterior to the pubic symphysis, so it's, it's low and behind the pubic symphysis. Uh, in the female, what happens is uh, you'll see this if I get a female reproductive system one up. If the, the bladder sits there and the, and the uterus actually uh, is forced forward, we talked that we we showed this a little bit maybe in the abdomen, but actually comes over the top. Okay, comes right over the top of the bladder, sits on the top. When they do a, 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 a bimanual exam or a manual exam, they actually feel the front of the abdomen just above the area of the pubis, and by pushing on the cervix, which is where the uterus um, extends into the, the vagina, they actually push the uterus forward, and they could feel it in the abdominal wall. Okay, so in the female, uh, it's basically inferior and anterior to the uterus, which arches over the top from back to front in, in the, with the bladder. Okay, again, the mucosal lining is this transitional epithelial. Okay, with a basement membrane, and that transitional epithelium, again, is very stretchable. The cells are exceptionally stretchable. Okay, and what happens is the the muscle. There's three layers of muscle in the bladder, and it's called the detrusor muscle. So underneath certain control, some type parasympathetic, it's going to be able to squeeze, and when it squeezes, it allows the urine to be expelled out through the tube to go to the outside. At the base of the bladder, there's also a sphincter. If you look right there, it says in, uh, internal urethral sphincter. Basically, there's a sphincter, and that's so you don't keep on wetting your pants. In other words, what will happen is it's, it's sort of, it's involuntary, so the body sort of, I need to, something from the nervous system, from the other nervous system to say, okay, relax, okay? Uh, but what happens, it's sort of involuntary. There's also a voluntary sphincter a little bit further on down the road, but that's an involuntary sphincter, and that keeps the urine in the bladder until you're ready to eliminate it. The top of the bladder is covered over with the serosa, which is basically, the, like I mentioned, the peritoneum. So if you hear serosa, it's basically in the abdomen, it's called, it's the peritoneum. It doesn't cover the whole bladder because most of the bladder sits in the pelvis. It only covers the top, like you see up in the, like in the image up in, in the upper right, okay? You can see where the, uh, one other thing I should mention about the bladder, Look, what I'd like you to look now is see what the little openings for the, uh, uh, the, the, where, the where the ureters come in, okay? Your ureteral openings, it says there's a little V-shaped uh, 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 diagram. Between those two and then going out through the tube that goes to the outside, see that triangular shaped area? The triangular shaped area is called the trigone. 
trigone. Tri means what? Three. And basically, a trigone is almost like a funnel. Okay, it's a funnel to be able to funnel the urine out through the area of the of the, the urethra, which goes to the outside, and that's called the trigone in the urinary bladder. You can see it, and if I look at that, you can see trigone. Right there, trigone. Here is the uh, ureteral openings, and the trigone is this area. This is right here, like a funnel. Okay, I think I would know that. That's probably a good thing to good thing to remember. It's called the trigone. Okay, and it's basically a funnel. Okay, so that's what we see in the in your bladder. Uh, here's that. Oh, here's the trigone. Okay, we'll go back again. I'll show you again a little bit closer. And here's the trigone. There's the ureteral opening right there. There's another one right there. It comes down there comes like there and so that allows the urine to be funneled out through this triangular shaped funneled area right there so it's it's formed by the inlet of the ureters which is one right here one right here and and at the base it goes out through what's called the, the urethra the urethra is going to be the tube that goes to the outside okay one thing i'm going to show on this image which i don't talk about a whole lot is this thing right here this puppy right here and that's only in males, okay? That area right here is called the prostate gland, okay? Prostate gland is a gland that surrounds the, uh, the urethra as it comes out. Um, interesting thing, um, as males get older, please don't look at me like that. As males get older, what happens is their testosterone changes. Their testosterone changes uh, by uh, a certain... Uh, uh, a reductase enzyme it changes it into what's called dihydrotestosterone okay it changes it from it's now dihydrotestosterone is still a strong testosterone but it has two other effects number effect number one male pattern baldness guys start losing the hair get a little thinner on the top and that happens because of the DHT the dihydrotestosterone the second effect is there are receptors on the prostate that that, uh, that this dihydrotestosterone attaches to and it increases the size of the prostate as it increases the size of the prostate it narrows the tube right here this tube here gets narrower so the prostate gets bigger and starts to squeeze the urethra as a result older males frequently have more difficult time passing their urine why because that prostate gets big okay there are other reasons for the prostate which we want to talk about right now but um, uh, they are there if we get to the reproductive system we'll talk about some of these other things that happen that the prostate is actually good for um, and so it's not a totally bad thing okay uh, again there is at the base of the of the bladder let's get rid of this stuff here at the base of the bladder we, we know that there is a sphincter so there's going to be a sphincter here, an involuntary sphincter right here, okay? And there are also a voluntary sphincters along the urethra. So as a result, we could actually help to control it. We could actually, you know, right, you know, potty training, teaching kids how to control their voluntary sphincters so they don't have to, you know, they don't wet their pants, okay? So anyway, that's the urine bladder. Um, one thing I want to talk about very simply is now that we know what those organs are, it's something called the micturition reflex, micturition reflex. What happens is the bladder uh, the kidneys make in the urine, and we'll talk a lot about how the urine is made in in, in, in upcoming uh, videos. Okay, and the bladder makes it. The, the, the kidney makes the urine, the urine, and the bladder walls start to stretch because you remember those remember those transitional cells in the bladder can stretch a lot. What this does is it, once it gets to a certain size, it stimulates again parasympathetic. I mentioned the GI was parasympathetic. The other part of the body that's under parasympathetic control seems to be the also the the, the, the bladder. Okay. And, the, and that, that's the vagus. The vagus, our friend, the vagus, it keeps on coming back to haunt us. Cranial nerve, 10, okay, the vagus nerve. And what happens is um, as the bladder stretches, it stimulates the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic activity, which relaxes the internal sphincter and contracts the detrusor muscles. Therefore, you better have a really important and strong external voluntary sphincter to be able to, to control that. This is something that we see sometimes in older males, a problem. It's called post micturitional syncope. Micturition means to urinate, urinate. So when you see the word micturition, micturition means urination, okay? And uh, older males, one of the problems that they get is when that prostate gets really big, okay? Uh, they keep grandma, grandma up at night. And the reason why they keep grandma up all night is because they have to get up to go to the darn bathroom 16 times. You know, every every half hour they're getting up, I gotta go to the bathroom again, Ruth, you know, and stuff like that. And they get to the bathroom. And so the problem is 
that uh, this and the reason why is because the prostate when it gets big because that's what happens with older males the prostate gets big when they urinate they don't completely empty the bladder they always leave a bunch of urine in the bladder so they make a little bit more and the bladder stretches enough it causes the sympathetic nerve to say hey let's go ahead and get rid of this okay so so what happens is they go to the bathroom and their prostate is big so what they do is they're staying there and if you hear these older guys they're grunting and groaning and squeezing and, and, and you know, grabbing stuff and stuff trying to get that urine to go because that prostate is so big and the the, urethra, the, the the urethral opening to the tube to the outside is so small okay that what happens is they squeeze as they squeeze it's like holding your breath okay now what stimulates the bladder to to contract the vagus nerve. We talked about that before. So now the vagus nerve, nerve is getting stimulated. We also combine that with someone holding their breath and forcing down their abdomen to try to do that, which also, as we showed before, stimulates the, mm, the vagus nerve. Well, the vagus nerve, then what does it do? In the heart, it slows the heart rate. We should know that. Remember we talked about you had to feel the pulse and you held your breath and your pulse rate went down? It slowed the heart rate. Now all of a sudden, Grandpa is sitting there trying to strain. His vagus nerve is saying, empty bladder, empty bladder, and the bladder doesn't want to empty because the prostate's too big, okay? And so he starts straining more, which causes a uh, causes actually two things. It causes a stimulation of the vagus nerve, plus it tightens everything up, and it decreases the venous return from the inferior vena cava up to the diaphragm. Tightens the diaphragm up. It just squeezes, and it tightens the diaphragm, and the vena cava gets shut off. So as a result, the blood flow to the heart decreases, the heart rate decreases, and what does Grandpa do? Beep! And lands and hits his head on the on the toilet as he as he passes out on the bathroom floor. Graham goes in and sees him laying there bleeding with a bloody head. Calls EMS, and, and it turns out it's post micturitional syncope. Okay, and that's because of excessive vagal stimulation coming from now a bunch, bunch of different things. Okay, so that that internal sphincter is controlled by the vagus nerve. Okay, and then the external sphincter is basically voluntarily controlled by the cerebral cortex. I could tell that when to go. Okay, so that's a little bit about this micturition reflex. Now the urethra, like I like I mentioned a couple times, is that outlet tube. Okay, it's the outlet tube from the bladder to the outside to the external urethral orifice, which is the opening of the urethra to the outside, which is also called the meatus, the meatus, okay? Uh, the urethral meatus. Uh, if you work in a nursing home or in a hospital and you see somebody that do a, a catheterization of the bladder, they actually open up the meatus a little bit. They take the catheter, put a little lubrication in there, stick the catheter in the end of the meatus, and, and jam it right up through the urethra into the bladder. And then at the end of the catheter, there's a little bubble, a little a balloon. They blow the balloon up so they can't come out. Well, I've seen guys pull that out, which is sort of bad. Uh, so, but anyway, the urethra is that is that tube from the urinary bladder to the outside. Okay, it's basically mucous membrane, uh, spongy tissue has a lot of veins in it, has a muscular coat and stuff like that that'll help to squeeze things out. Okay, and that's the that's the uh, urethra. One thing I mentioned before uh, that I'm going to come back to now now that we're on the urethra is I, I mentioned before that females are much more likely to have bladder infections than males. And the reason is very simple and multiple. First of all, the urethra in females <laughs> is shorter. Males, it's longer. Okay, So the urethra in females is shorter. Shorter distance for the bacteria to go from the outside inside. Second thing is that the urethra in the males is at the end of the penis. The urethra in the females is just superior to the vaginal opening, which means that there's a lot of normal vaginal bacteria that create good vaginal health. In other words, there has to be um, uh, things, uh, the, the bacteria that will actually keep good vaginal health there. In fact, when, when females sometimes take an antibiotic, it's not unusual for them to get a, quote, yeast infection uh, in the vaginal region. And why? Because the bacteria control the, the growth of the yeast, okay, which is different from bacteria. Control the growth of the yeast. When you eliminate the bacteria from an, act, from an antibiotic, the yeast say, hey, let's go play. And all of a sudden, the yeast starts to multiply and creates this curdly yellowish, you know, like a cottage cheesy like discharge, which is basically the yeast. Okay. So basically, the, the urethral opening in females is closer to an area which has more bacterial contamination naturally and normally. Okay. The third reason why males have less urinary tract infection is they also think that maybe the prostate uh, 
uh, has some good to it. So the, uh, the one thing the prostate may do, it actually adds secretions. So in other words, spermatozoa are made in the testicle, and the testicle then sends through this long tube called a vas deferens, about two, two feet long tube, that takes it up behind the bladder, it mixes up with what's called the seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles add more fluid, then what happens is the seminal vesicles on the back, there's one on the right, one on the left, they come together, what's called an ejaculatory duct, which goes through the prostate, and the prostate may add some secretions to that, and that ejaculatory duct then empties into the urethra to be able to have that semen, which is the spermazoa plus all these other fluids mixed together. There's another little uh, gland underneath the prostate called the bulbourethral gland or copper gland that will also add fluid to that. But what happens, they actually think that the, the, the prostate may actually have some uh, antibacterial um, uh, effects from the secretion that it has that actually prevents the bacteria from entering the bladder. Okay. Another good thing about the prostate, since I'm at the prostate, is the prostate also has smooth muscle. So what happens is during the course of ejaculation, what will happen is the prostate will actually squeeze, rhythmically squeeze, 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 squeeze. And that's what ejects the spermatozoa and the semen out through the air and of the penis. But anyway, that's a little bit about the urethra and its other ancillary structures. Okay. Uh, again, the female, and a couple other things is in the females, the urethra is separate from the reproductive tract, where in the males, it's the same. In other words, the spermatozoa is ejected out through the urethra, and the urethra is part of the of the uh, urinary tract. In the female, the the genital tract is is totally separate. They're close, but totally separate. Okay. In males, it's part of the reproductive tract. Again, through the prostate, which is called the prostatic urethra, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, that's what we talk. About. Otherwise, on this, you don't have to worry about too much else besides that. Okay. But that's just a little bit about the the male versus the female urethra. Okay. Uh, now, let me just give you a little bit of a preamble to what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of videos. How does the kidney make urine. It's not a real simple procedure. It's a very compli complex procedure, and we're going to be touching, barely scratching the surface of it. And there's a lot of stuff I'm going to show you on some slides going on. You can say, do I have to know all that? And I'm going to say, well, I, I, you don't have to know it all, but I'll tell you what you need to know. Okay. What happens is when the blood gets to the kidney, it goes through a series of three things. First is filtration. It has blood that gets into these little capillaries, and this cap, these capillaries filter almost everything. They filter 100 plus liters of, of fluid per day. Okay, Definitely, we don't give out 100 plus liters of urine per day. So it filters. But then it goes through a series of tubules in the kidneys, and what happens is most of that that's filtered is taken back, and that's called reabsorption. You take it back. Okay, And then finally, as I get to the end of this long series of tubules, which we'll talk about, which is called the nephron, and I get to the end of it, we say that the kidney says, or the body says, hmm, you know what, I'm going to give you a little bit as a parting gift. I'm going to give you a little bit of this stuff to take with you, and that's called secretion. Okay, So we go through filtration, reabsorption, and secretion in that order through the kidneys. Okay, uh, And then the, so that's as the kidney, it, it happens in the area of the kidney before it even gets to those calyces. Once that urine gets to the calyces, it's done. That's it. No changes. Boom. The only changes it's going to get is something that picks up along the way, which is very unusual, other than bacteria or cells or something like that. Okay. So the urine flows from the kidney through the ureters to the urinary bladder, and then the urinary bladder becomes a storage area for the urine, and then finally with voiding or micturition, the urinary bladder, the detrusor muscle squeezes and forces the urine to the outside. Okay, and that's what your system does. Now, this is something that they always put in there, and I, you know, I, I'm sort of embarrassed to have to put in there. It says organs of elimination. Oh my goodness, what are the organs of elimination? Well, the skin, because we evaporate through the skin. The intestines, we know that we get rid of things to the intestines. The lung, carbon dioxide. The liver, we have to get rid of a lot of things, and then we add the kidney. Okay, so they use the word skull, skill, skill. You know what? Guess what? Ain't gonna be on an exam. Ain't gonna be on an exam. But it's just that. Okay. Uh, and there's the kidneys again. We I don't know someone got this back here again, but that's the kidneys again. So we don't have to do that again. Uh, let me just mention a couple other things about the kidneys while we while we tidy this up, because that's where this is all gonna start and where things happen. Again, if I look at the kidneys on the outside, the outer portion in here is the renal cortex, okay? Is the renal cortex. And at the renal cortex is where these little uh, functional units of the kidney, which are called the nephrons, start from. 
So the outer portion is the renal cortex. So it is functional. It is what starts the ball rolling in the outer cortical region of the kidney. That's the outer cortex. Okay. We have our inner medulla. And the inner medulla is basically, let me use a different color. Let me use light green here. The inner medulla is all this area in here. Okay. These are called renal pyramids. Guess why they're called renal pyramids? Because they look like pyramids, obviously. Okay. Those are the renal pyramids, and that's part of the renal medulla. And this is where a lot of the action occurs. A lot of the concentration, a lot of things are added inside that. And there's the, 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 these renal pyramids. Okay. Have what are called the base. The base would be the flat area up in here. Okay. Have the papilla, which is basically this area right here, and papillary ducts, which actually lead into the collecting ducts which actually go into the calyces okay so and between the renal pyramids are what are called renal columns and the renal columns are basically these areas right here that are between the renal pyramids those are the renal columns okay so if I look at the anatomical structure of the kidney that's that those are the renal columns okay so uh, and what happens is they say the pyramids which are the part of the of the medulla plus the cortex which is the outside is equal to what's called the renal parenchyma or the functional unit of the kidneys okay let me get rid of all these these crazy drawings of the cortex and the medulla and the pyramids and all that other stuff like that and you can look that over it all shows in here what happens is inside the kidney then I have what's called the pelvis the renal pelvis okay and we have major and minor calyces see like here this is a little vat area that's collecting a little vat area a little vat area that's collecting a little vat area that's collecting one right there and there's a bunch of those and those are called the minor calyces minor calyces so what happens is in this area in the renal pyramids they're making the urine the urine's coming down tubes called collecting ducts and they empty into these area of the calyces when the urine is finally made a main minor calyx goes into a, let me change this over a little bit, minor calyx empties into a major calyx, and that major calyx empties into the renal pelvis, which is right here, and that renal pelvis then leads down the ureter. Okay, so the urine is collecting in all these little vats called the calyces in the in, in the renal pelvis. Okay, and you can see those are all annotated here on this picture and stuff like that to show you exactly what that's all about. This is just an actual picture. Let me get rid of the, the drawings because it's in the way. Okay, and this is a kidney, a human kidney that they've actually uh, uh, transected, and you can see where the you can see where the renal pyramids are. You know, I can see the renal pyramids. Here's a pyramid right here. You know, here are the uh, let's see, uh, renal columns, a renal column. Like you see a renal column here, and here's a renal column, here's a renal column, renal column. You can see the area of the calyces, minor calyx. You know, minor calyx up in here, up in here, here. And then we get to major calyx. We're talking about down in here, here, and we see the renal pelvis. Which is down in here, and the and the and the ureter is going to be coming out that way. So basically, that's what we see in a real life kidney, and that's the way it looks. Okay, if we look in that major minor calyx as well as the renal pelvis and the ureter, it's all urine that's to totally formed. There's nothing else you have to do with it. Okay, it's 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 end of the end of the row. Okay, a couple other things I want to mention here. Okay, and that's a little about the blood supply to the kidneys. One of the things is that's sort of uh, interesting about the renal arteries, it gets about 20 to 25 percent of my cardiac output. Wow. That means the amount of blood, about 20% of the blood that my body pumps around in a resting state per minute goes to my kidneys. It means that these two small fish-sized organs have to be really important because basically they're getting a lot of that blood supply. Okay. Now what I want you to recognize here, okay, is that when I look at the blood supply, obviously what comes from the aorta was something that we talked about in the arterial thing, which is called the renal artery. Okay. The renal artery enters into the area of the kidney, it comes off the aorta and goes right to the kidney. I have a right renal artery and a left renal artery. Okay. I think I mentioned in the um, uh, lab that the right renal artery is longer than the left renal artery. And that makes sense. Why? Because the aorta is slightly to the left of the midline. So therefore it has to go longer distance to the right kidney and a shorter distance to go to the left. Okay. We also mentioned that the right renal artery is lower than the left. Why? Because the right renal artery is lower because the right kidney is lower because of the, of the liver. Okay. What happens is we get smaller and smaller arteries. And don't worry about segmental, interlobar, uh, arguate, interlobular, or anything like that. But 
I'm going to really throw a monkey wrench in all the systems we've talked about. Who's ready for the monkey wrench? Here's the monkey wrench. In the past, when we talked about the circulation, we went from an artery to our interior to a capillary to a venule to a vein. Well, guess what? Kidney says, mm -mm, not me, I'm special. And what the kidney does is it actually changes this up a bit. What it does is it changes it up so that what happens is um, we go from an arteriole to a capillary. Okay, that's good, that's, that's fine. But then we go back to another arteriole. Hmm arterial capillary arterial and then we go to back to another capillary now let me explain why this happens what happens is the kidney like I mentioned earlier in this uh, presentation um, has to filter and what we want to do is if we want to filter more we have to send more blood to the capillaries because the capillaries are obviously where the blood's going to be filtered why because the walls are thin they got slits and all kinds of stuff like that so what happens is going into the, the, the functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron. It's called the nephron. And the first place it goes to are what's, what's called the glomerulus. Now the glomerulus is a ball of capillaries. It's a bunch of capillaries in a big ball and surrounded by a cup. Okay, and everything that's filtered is caught in a cup that starts to go down a tube. And I'll show you that in our next PowerPoint video. But what happens is coming into that ball of capillaries called the glomerulus, I have what's called the afferent arteriole, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, because we know afferent means going into something. So I have the afferent arteriole going into this ball of capillaries, but then coming out of that ball of capillaries, I have what's called the efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, arterioles. They come out of there because it's, everything that leaves is efferent going in, afferent going out, leave, efferent. Why? This makes a lot of sense. Let's say I need to increase the filtration. A lot of fluid, stuff like that. So how do I increase the filtration to that ball of capillaries where the filtration is going to occur in that glomerulus? By increasing the pressure in those glomerular capillaries. Well, how can I decrease, how can I increase the glomerular pressure? So simple. What is their characteristic about an arterial? The muscle, the walls have smooth muscle in them. They could either expand or contract. They could relax and dilate, or they can constrict and, 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 and get smaller. So here's what happens. If I need more blood flow into the glomerular capillaries to increase the pressure in the glomerular capillaries, to increase the filtration, why don't I decrease the size of the efferent arterial coming out of those capillaries and increase the size of the afferent arterial going in. Logical. Because what happens if I have a lot more coming in and less coming out, there's going to be more that clogs up those capillaries that makes them dilate, increase pressure in there, more filtration. And that's why the kidneys go from an go from uh, artery to arterial and then the afferent arterial going into that ball of capillaries, which is called the glomerulus, and then out of that ball of capillaries called the efferent arterial, because by changing the size of the afferent and efferent arterial, I can actually regulate the blood flow and the amount of blood that's in the glomerular capillaries and the pressure in the blood inside the capillaries. I want more filtration, more blood flow, higher pressure, Increase the afferent size, the diameter, decrease the efferent. There, there's more coming in, less coming out. It backs up. Makes sense. So where do we go from that efferent arteriole? What happens is the nephron starts out with this glomerulus where we filter stuff. After the glomerulus, we go through a long series of tubules. And I'll show you that in the next video. In the next video, it's going to be a lot, a lot more apparent. But during the next long section of the nephron, I do two things. I reabsorb things, take things back, and I push things back in what's called secretion near the end. Well, where are things going to go in and out of vests of, of, you know, they're going to go in and out of the vest? At the capillaries. Makes sense. So what happens is after the efferent arteriole leaves the glomerulus, I have a whole other set of capillaries that surround all these tubules. So that what happens is, like, like I said, we, we filter everything. We filter, you know, 100 plus liters a day. We take back about 98.5% of that. Where do I just go? Back into the vessels. So I have to have capillaries around these tubules to be able to take things back. And then finally, at near, when, we, when it gets to be clo to, close to the finished product, I might want to throw a few things in. How are they going to get into the tubules to be excreted? By the capillaries 
that it will excrete will, that will uh, let them flow from the capillaries and into the tubules to be excreted. So basically, what we have in the in the kidney, we have a very unique arterial vascular setup, going from artery to arterial to capillary to arterial to capillary, and then we go to a venial. So we have a whole set of arterioles and capillaries in between. I think that should make sense in regards to that, okay? Normally the efferent arteriole is slightly smaller than the afferent. That still at least keeps pressure. If I make my um, uh, efferent arteriole much wider than, than the afferent, then guess what? I'm, I'm just draining it as fast as it gets in there. Okay, so yeah, the efferent is usually a little bit smaller than the afferent going in there. So basically, that's the monkey wrench that I wanted to bring in here, which will probably be a little bit more uh, apparent when we talk a little about the process of how urine is made in the PowerPoint video number two. So hopefully that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, we'll go over it a little bit more again in the next video. But it is one of the unique things about the kidneys and one of the very uh, uh, precise areas of engineering that makes the kidneys work the way they do. Okay, so I just wanted to bring that into you before we get to the next. So you could think about it before we get into the next next video. So, hopefully, what we've learned in this video is that um, we we're able to. Uh, uh, go through a number of processes in making urine. We have to filter, and then what happens is we reabsorb most of what we filter, and then we secrete a bunch at the end, a little bit at the end to make it the fine-tuned stuff, you know, the last little bit. So like that, you know, you see the the, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, Iron Chef who puts everything on a plate and then sprinkles a little stuff on the top just to make it look nice, and that's the secretion, okay? We talked about the various organs in regards to the urinary system. You know, the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, the urethra, and the idiosyncrasies of all those. What's going to happen is, as I, I, if you understand a lot of that, what's going to in, in our next video, we're going to be talking about how urine is made, okay? And which is a, a pretty of a detailed process, but I think you need to know these basics before we get to there. Hopefully, uh, that uh, most of this stuff has been pretty clear to you, and uh, we'll see you in our next video. In the meantime, stay uh, safe, uh, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you.